Chemical warfare is synonymous with the First World War. Soldiers choking to death from gas attack is probably one of the most enduring images of the conflict. Mainly, it has to be said, due to the poetry of men like Wilfred Owen. During the First World War, gas became a commonplace battlefield weapon, but its effectiveness has been overplayed in popular perceptions of that conflict. This video is going to look at the different types of battlefield gases used in the First World War, how they were deployed, and then assess their effectiveness in combat. The history of chemical weapons in the First World War goes back as far as the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. These bans the use of poison or poisoned weapons in warfare. Curiously, this banning took place before any of the major European armies had actually used chemical weapons in war. When the First World War began in July of 1914, only the French army had any stocks of chemical weapons. These were tear gas shells and they were used on the German soldiers in August. However, the quantities of shells and the amount of chemical in the shells were so small that they were not even detected by the German troops. Later in October of 1914, at New Chapelle, the Germans fired irritant-filled fragmentation shells at the British lines. As with the previous French use, the concentration was so small that this was barely noticed by the Allied soldiers. As the Hague Convention had specifically banned the launching of asphyxiating chemicals, none of the combatants considered this tear gas to be a contravention of the Convention. On the 31st of January 1915, the Germans fired 18,000 shells of tear gas at Russian positions during the Battle of Bolimov. Despite the huge amount fired in this case, the frozen conditions caused the gas to freeze and its effect was again negligible. However, by this time Germany had begun exploring the effects of asphyxiating chemicals as a means to kill enemy soldiers. German chemical companies had produced chlorine as a byproduct of the dye manufacturing processes and it was found that chlorine will cause damage to the eyes, nose, throats and lungs, and in high concentrations it was lethal. Led by Fritz Haber and the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Chemicals in Berlin, the chemical companies of BASF, Hoist and Bayer began developing methods of delivering the chemical in battlefield conditions against enemy trenches. Working fast, the Germans had amassed a stockpile of chlorine gas weighing 168 tonnes by the spring of 1915. On the 22nd of April, chlorine gas was released from 5,730 cylinders at Langemark Port Capel, north of the city of Ypres. The chlorine created a cloud of greyish green and drifted on the light breeze towards the French colonial troops from Martinique and Algeria. The French troops panicked in the face of this new threat and retreated, which in turn opened up a 7 km hole in the Allied front line. The Germans had underestimated the effect and had not provided for reinforcements to take advantage of this success. Meanwhile, Canadian soldiers at Saint-Julien and other French troops were able to plug the gap and the Allied line held. The Allied government maintained that this attack was a flagrant disregard of the Hague Convention, with the Germans counter-arguing that the Convention had only banned launched chemical weapons and not cylinder-based attacks. During the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans launched more gas attacks with many fatalities on the Allied side. The Germans also launched gas attacks on the Eastern Front at Roca, causing around 9,000 casualties, of which about 1,000 were fatal. However, the effectiveness of chlorine lay in its psychological effects rather than its effect of killing. The sight of a gas cloud rolling across no man's land was dreaded by the soldiers in its path. It was quickly realised that the men who stood their ground during a gas attack suffered less than those that moved, and the higher up from the ground they were also helped with lessening the effects. Chlorine is heavier than air, so the tendency was for it to sink to the bottom of trenches and shell craters. It's also soluble in water, and covering the mouth and nose with a damp cloth was also helpful at combating these effects. It was also thought that urine was even better than water for this. The amount of chlorine needed to kill was very high, so as a killing agent it wasn't particularly effective, especially when soldiers were issued with rudimentary protection, such as dampened gauzes for their faces. The British soldiers began to be supplied with protective pads as early as the 24th of April, two days after the initial German attack. Other methods for anti-gas protection also included fans for wafting the clouds away and sprays set up in the front line, although the effectiveness of these methods is debatable. By July of 1915, the entire British army was provided with a new smoke helmet, a sack with a celluloid window worn on the head to stop the inhalation of gas. This first effective gas mask marked the beginning of the arms race between effective chemical weapons and their countermeasures, which lasted until 1918. At the Battle of Luz in 1915, the British Army launched its first chlorine gas attack. Using 140 cylinders of gas on the 25th of September, the attack was a disaster. 
The prevailing winds favoured the Germans, and even though the conditions were initially good, the wind changed direction. Some of the gas lingered in no man's land, and in some places actually blew back onto the British trenches. On top of this, the engineers who had been tasked with releasing the gas had not been provided with the correct size turning key for the cylinders that they were using. German counter-battery fire hit these unopened canisters, releasing more gas into the British trenches. Also, the soldiers using the smoke helmets quickly experienced their limitations. They got hot, the lens misted up, and breathing was very difficult. Men that then removed these masks to be able to breathe were gassed. During 1915, the French began their own experimentation with gas, and they developed phosgene, a far deadlier chemical than chlorine. The effects of phosgene didn't always manifest themselves until 24 hours after exposure, which meant that the soldiers could continue to fight in the time immediately after the attack, but would fall ill much later. Phosgene was sometimes mixed with chlorine to help the phosgene gas spread. The Germans first used phosgene on the 19th of December in 1915 against British positions near Ypres when 69 men were killed of the 1,069 who were injured by it. Despite this being a new gas, the British soldiers were protected by the P-helmet, a sack cloth bag impregnated with sodium phenylate as a protection against phosgene. This was later upgraded to the pH hood, with hexamethylene tetramine also added. Phosgene remains relatively unknown amongst the battlefield gases of the First World War, but it was only second in chlorine to the amount manufactured. The short amount of time that it was in use is probably the reason it is not better known. During 1916, the use of gas dropped somewhat largely because of the lack of an effective way of delivering it that wasn't dependent on the weather, and also the instability of the shell delivery meant that it became less of a viable weapon. It was hard to control and soldiers were not particularly keen about attacking into an area covered in a gas cloud. However, in early 1917 the Germans developed sulphur mustard, better known as mustard gas, probably the best known of all the chemical agents used in the war. It was introduced during the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917 and marked a change in the tactical use of battlefield gases. Mustard gas is not an effective killing gas, it has to injure somebody at very high dose to be fatal. Its primary effect is blistering of exposed skin. However, if it got into the lungs it would attack the bronchial surfaces, causing internal bleeding and stripping the mucous membrane of the lungs. Victims could take weeks to die painfully. By this point in the war, the troops were issued with effective gas masks to attempt to stop this happening. The British small box respirator, for example, had a changeable filter system and if worn correctly and quickly was a good defence against all gases. Also, men who suffered from blistered skin and the temporary blindness caused by mustard gas could be cured of it within three weeks providing they were able to get to medical facilities. Its effectiveness lay in removing casualties from the battlefield. Killing a man only removes one person. Injuring a man means that others are also removed from the battlefield in helping him get to medical aid. Mustard gas was primarily used as an area denial weapon. An area to be attacked would be boxed off with a gas barrage to stop reinforcements entering and disrupting any attempt to retreat. Gas shells had also developed sufficiently to allow for an effective delivery system that could be landed quite accurately. Gas barrages were aimed at points of congestion in the rear areas to disrupt the transport of supplies from fresh troops and the movement of casualties. It was also used in counter-battery work against artillery positions. Wearing a gas mask was effective against the chemicals, but it made the men tired and reduced the efficiency of their firing as a consequence. Mustard gas was also heavier than air and would sink into shell craters and puddles, forming an oily film on the surface. In this way it was used to pollute areas of the battlefield. Once dropped it could lay undetected for a long time until the surface was broken and the gas released, gassing unsuspecting soldiers. As an effective killing weapon, the gas of the First World War is overrepresented in the popular imagination. British estimates for the war from data recorded since 1916 concluded that only 3% of casualties from gas were fatal, 2% were permanently invalided, and 70% were fully recovered within 6 weeks of being gassed. Gas was one of a plethora of battlefield weapons and was generally counted as such by the men of the First World War. Many men were claiming to have suffered from the long term of effects of being gassed in the war for decades following. But we have to remember that this is a time when heavy industry was not controlled by health and safety when it came to healthy breathing conditions, and cigarettes and pipes were smoked in vast quantities by the majority of the population. How many of these men were suffering from lung diseases caused by these effects will remain a mystery. <laughs>